Healthcare is in a state of chaos. Some people get really good care, and others don't. We can do better. If we want to improve the care for our family, friends, neighbors, and community, we have to think differently about the way that healthcare is designed, how we intersect with our community's challenges, what we do to help people, not only when they're sick or injured, but during health, and how we help to care for the entire person. As a physician and health system administrator for more than two decades, I've been a student of how health systems are designed and how they make an impact in the community. As a cancer survivor, I've seen the gaps in care that occur from those very same systems. I know we can do better. It's time to roll up our sleeves and get the work done. Let me tell you how. The doctor-patient relationship is a very, very important relationship. Doctors are privileged to hear your most sacred secrets. Patients look to their doctors with the hope of cure. As a physician myself, I never actually realized how important my role was in the lives of the patients and the families that I served. We need to make sure that no matter what we do to redesign healthcare, we preserve this important relationship. When I had my cancer, I spent some time in the hospital getting surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation. And the hospital was responsible for the coordination of my care. When I needed surgery, I met my doctor in the operating room, and there was a team there to care for me that had the skills, the expertise, and the technology to make sure that I got the right procedure and I was able to be safely returned to my room. When I needed medications, my doctor ordered them in a computer, they were routed to the pharmacy, and the pharmacy did an amazing job of titrating, making sure they had exactly the right dose, sent them to the floor where the nurses administered them to me and monitored me for side effects. When I needed a CAT scan, I was brought to radiology. The scan was performed, the results were routed to my physician so that my plan of care could be improved. Overall, this is a very well-coordinated system in most parts of the United States. From a payer perspective, the people who actually pay the bills, whether it's your insurance company or the government under Medicaid or Medicare, two checks are written. One check goes to the doctor to pay them for professional services, and one check goes to the hospital for the coordination of care. A very seamless and integrated system. However, when you cross the border of the hospital and go back into the community, that's where chaos emerges. The doctor-patient relationship is still essential in the conversation. However, the coordination responsibility is handed to the patient and the family. I'm a physician myself. I've designed healthcare systems. But the chaos that emerges in the outpatient arena is very, very difficult to navigate. You've all been through this. Imagine what happens. You go to the doctor's office, they write you a couple of prescriptions, and they hand them to you. And you have to think, are you going to drop those medication prescriptions off at the pharmacy before or after you pick up the kids from school? If you drop them off before, that means two trips to the pharmacy, right? What if you need a CT scan? It's so easy to write on a prescription pad. Then they hand it to you, and you have to think, well, where do I get one of those? Do I have to go through pre-approval? Will my insurance pay for it? Oh, wait a minute, do I even have insurance? These are the realities that people in healthcare face. In addition, not only is the care chaotic, it's also expensive because the payer pays every single intersection point. They pay the doctor for the professional services, they pay the pharmacy for the medications, they pay for the CAT scan. Really, really complicated mess. I remember one night in my care in particular. I was sitting on the couch, weak and feverish, had chills, didn't know what was happening. So I picked up the phone and I called my physician. And I said, hey, here's the story. 
what do we do next? And he said, I want you to go to the emergency room where I spent the next 12 hours waiting and waiting and waiting. And when I finally got in, what happened? I had to share my deepest secrets with strangers. And you would think they would have this well organized, right? Because, I mean, after all, I was under care. You could think they could look it up in a record somewhere, or perhaps even have a conversation with one another, so I don't have to keep answering the same questions over and over and over again. But unfortunately, that's not how it goes. And what happens 12 hours later? You leave the emergency department with three more prescriptions, feeling worse than when you went in, and having to coordinate your care. Well, there's a way around this. If we redesign the way that we think about healthcare in the future, we actually have to preserve the doctor-patient relationship and make sure that we're able to, to continue to drive that important intersection. But we also need a coordinator. We need a coordinating mechanism that allows the patient and the family to get the kind of care they need without having to be the quarterback. And I propose that we do that through something that I call networks. A network is simply a geographically distributed group of clinical services. They would be out and about in the community where patients live, so that patients don't have to come to us, we're actually there providing services to them. And it's not such a crazy concept, in fact. We have lots of networks available now in healthcare. There are hospital networks, there are physician networks. God, we even have trauma networks. So that if you are acutely injured or traumatized, you get brought to a trauma center out and about in the community distributed where you might be able to get centralized care quickly because minutes matter. We have networks in neonatal intensive care so that if you're a pregnant mom going to deliver a premature baby, you can be brought to a hospital that focuses on intensive care for babies. Good care, well-coordinated, thoughtfully approached. If we had a blank piece of paper, we could really think about how we might apply other networks in the community to be more comprehensive in the way that we do this. You could imagine pharmacy networks and radiology networks. You could imagine wellness and prevention networks that were there to help coordinate the total care that people need, whether they're well or whether they're sick. It's a much more simplified version than that chaos that we saw before. And it's also more efficient and less expensive, because in this mechanism, two checks get written, just like in the hospital environment. One check to the doctor for professional services, and one check to the coordinating mechanism of the networks to make sure that patients are getting the coordinated care. Well, you know, system redesign is only one piece of the puzzle, and it's actually a very small piece. What's more important about our overall health status is something that is called the social determinants of health. These social determinants are what exists in our community. Things like poverty, things like homelessness, things like food insecurity and crime, lack of education. Those issues contribute to a lower health status than all of the health care delivery that we talked about before. In fact, your environment and the social determinants are responsible for about 90% of the community's overall health status. But we've been missing the boat as healthcare organizations because we haven't been intervening in the social determinants of health. Sounds kind of crazy, but it's important. Imagine that you're a teen mom, and you're getting ridiculed for not getting your infant the appropriate immunizations. But what's really on your priority list is whether or not you're going to have enough money by the end of the month to buy that baby food. When you live in an area of crime, right, and we ridicule people all the time for a lack of prevention, not getting their mammography, not getting their colonoscopy, but on their priority list, they're worried about their safety when they walk outside the front door of their home and whether or not they get, might get mugged. These are the realities of communities around the country and until we start to engage with the community's needs, we'll never be able to achieve the kinds of health status that we hope to for the communities that we're serving. In addition, my colleagues and I have had the whole dialogue upside down. 
We've been focusing primarily on what's called the length of stay. The length of stay is the period of time that you spend in the hospital, right? And everything that we do as health administrators and as doctors is focused on how long you stay in the hospital. Why? Because that's how we get paid, by the way. But here's what's interesting. That's not how the patient and family view it. They view life intersected by a hospitalization when you're eight for pneumonia, a hospitalization when you're 13 for an appendectomy, a hospitalization at 28 when you have a baby, and a hospitalization at 72 because you accidentally fell and broke your hip. The patient and family view life intersected by a series of hospitalizations. Well, in healthcare, we actually haven't been supporting people particularly well during life. Imagine that we could think differently about how we help people manage their stress or control their obesity or stop smoking, or help them with their addictions. Wow. If we were there for people so that we could answer questions about what vitamins to take or what herbal medicines to take, we actually might live healthier. I know that sounds crazy, but we haven't been involved in that, and it's really, really important. Finally, I know that for me, during my cancer care, I had an amazing team, great colleagues, wonderful people, doctors, nurses, pharmacists, therapists, dietitians who took really good care of me. They wanted me back to my physical health. But nobody actually ever asked me what I was concerned about. And sometimes when you're a young man with cancer, what really matters is getting off the couch and being able to have a meal with your family, or being able to attend your eight-year-old soccer game, or your nine-year-old's concert at school. My team was really focused on the physical domain, but they completely left out my mind, my spirit, and my priorities. And if we're going to restore people to health, we need to think comprehensively about the way that we approach them. So as we think more concretely about the way in which we have to think about health and not just healthcare as healthcare organizations, it's important that we're redesigning appropriately. It's important that we're paying attention to the needs of our community because the social determinants matter. It's important for us to make sure that we pay attention to not only health care, but the life that people are experiencing, how to maintain them in good health. And finally, we have to take a comprehensive look at the people that we're serving, not patients, but people, and make sure that we're addressing their needs from a mind, body, and spirit perspective. If we do that, we will not only be improving the community's health, we will actually create healthy communities. Thank you.